Well, good morning and welcome. Today is Sunday, May the 17th, and we're glad you're here. I want to go ahead and get started this morning in the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Uh, before we pray, I would invite you to listen to the words and the invitation of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. With the words and the invitation of Jesus that I've just read, I would like to invite you to join me in prayer as we get started. Almighty God, this morning as we hear your word in the words of Jesus, we hear this invitation that you extend to us that we would come to you. That especially those that labor, that are heavy laden, those of us that are burdened, either in spirit, in soul, in mind, in body, in the circumstances of our life, you know us, you know our situation, our circumstances, you know our trials and our errors, and you invite us to come to you. And so, Lord, we thank you for this glorious invitation. We thank you, Lord, that you would invite us even in the midst of our troubles, that we would draw near to you, that we would know you, and indeed that we could be known by you. So Lord, this morning, as we gather across the internet and wherever everyone is tuning in from, we thank you, Lord, that you are with us, and we hear the words of Jesus that would beckon us to come. And I just want to pray quickly for a few things. First off, I want to pray this morning for the lonely and the suffering, and the burdened. I know there's a way in which every single one of us has isolation and loneliness, uh, suffering of various kinds and burdens. But in particular, I want to pray for those who are singularly burdened this morning, who are suffering in a variety of ways in their body, mind, or soul. Perhaps those that are hungry, those that are homeless, even those that are distressed or displaced, those who are suffering in their physical body, those that are suffering economically, those that are, uh, I mean, I just think across the street from me here in the jail, there are people incarcerated. And Lord, I just want to lift up to you the lonely and the burdened this morning. Lord, this is certainly a time of quarantine and isolation, and we feel that. And then also there's there are people that are truly alone, uh, at least naturally speaking. And we pray, whoever they are, wherever they are, that you would come alongside them, that you would remind them that they are not alone to the extent that you are with them really and truly. And I pray you would reassure them of your nearness and your presence. So, Lord, I thank you for the uh, invitation to come. Lord, also, I want to pray this morning for marriages and families. The marriages and the families are uh, represented by those that are listening today. And <clears throat> Lord, I pray for husbands and wives. I pray for mothers and fathers. I pray for, for children and parents. I pray for brothers and sisters that are locked down in our various homes. And Lord, I pray for continued grace and mercy that we could uh, be united together in love and unity, united in the bond of peace through Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would give peace and comfort in our homes, that you would draw us to one another. I pray that relationships would become stronger during this season of quarantine, stronger as opposed to being torn apart by the nearness of, of sinful people one to another. And so, Lord, we pray for your help. We ask for your grace. And we thank you that you invite us to draw near to you with those burdens. Lord, finally, I think about the, the words from Second Chronicles chapter 7, 14, uh, where you were addressing your people Israel. And you said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, 
Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Lord, we know these verses are applicable to the land of Israel specifically. Uh, that you said if, if your people abandoned you and you brought judgment upon their land, that if, if they would turn to you in repentance and trust and faith, then you would uh, bring healing to their land. Lord, these words echo in our minds this morning as we think about the brokenness of our world, as we think about the brokenness of our uh, lives, of the uh, economic system, our health system. We think about um, our political system. We think about uh, the brokenness of our society right now. We're not even able to meet together. And there's sickness and disease. There's all kinds of concerns and worries in the world around us. And, and, and we see, Lord, we recognize that these types of, of struggles are, uh, there's a way in which they're judgment on our world. You, you are reminding us that things are not as they should be. Uh, that you didn't make the world like this, and it's a result of sin and rebellion against you. And so, Lord, it's not simply the, the non-Christians that you invite to repentance. Indeed, it is your very own people that you call to repentance. And so, Lord, we pray for the nations of the world, the, the, all the families of the earth and individuals. Lord, I pray that people would come to know you during this season. I pray that those that have been in rebellion against you would would find repentance and faith and trust in Christ. But Lord, in this verse, you also are inviting us, your people, to acknowledge our sin before you, to cry out to you because you are our only hope and remedy. So Lord, this morning, as we begin our time together, we begin by humbling ourselves before you. Lord, we begin by confessing our sin and our rebellion against you, our sin our rebellion against you. Even though we are redeemed and we've been uh, made new in Jesus Christ, we still, it, so often, we still go our own way in our hearts, our minds, and our actions. And so, Lord, we just begin by humbling ourselves before you. We confess our deep need of your mercy and forgiveness in an ongoing way. And, Lord, we pray that you will not only heal and restore our land, but Lord, we pray you would continue to heal and restore us. Rebuild, rebuild the ruins, I pray, of our lives and our world in such a way that it will bring ultimately glory and honor to you. So Father, we love you. We thank you. I thank you even this morning as we open up your word that you're beginning again that process of restoration, the renewal of our minds, the transformation of our lives. And Lord, we invite you to do it. So now as we open your word, I pray that you will speak to us, that you will change us, and that you will reveal yourself to us in a new and living way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're just getting up and running here uh, for this morning. If you've been with us, you know that um, we're in the book of Romans. In particular, we're in the book of Romans chapter 12, working our way through that great book. And, and if you've been with us, you know this is the section of the book of Romans that I'm referring to as the continental divide of the book of Romans. Because from chapters 1 through 11, all the way up until this point, what the Apostle Paul has been doing is explaining and unpacking and declaring the various truths and realities about the nature of God and the truth and the nature of of the gospel. And so Paul has been unfolding us uh, these things for us and inviting us to, to not only see them, but to behold them. To not only see and understand and to ask questions and to have them answered, but the end result that we might behold the nature of God and that we might rightly understand the nature of the gospel and that we might worship the God of the Bible for who he is for all he has done and for what he's like. And, uh, and so this has been going on in the book of Romans all the way up to this point. Like the continental divide here, he's now tipped over. And for the rest of the book of Romans, uh, Paul is going to spend the next couple of chapters just 
explaining uh, in very simple terms, very often, the way in which those truths and realities apply very practically to our lives. And so there's a lot of application uh, as Paul brings to bear the implications of those prior truths into the human life. So so anyway, this is uh, what Paul has been talking about uh, up to this point. This is what we've been talking about up to this point. But again, just to review in the beginning of chapter 12, as Paul concludes and he tips over the continental divide of this great book, he begins in verse 1 by saying, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. And so by the mercies of God, because of everything Paul's been explaining about, the way in which God has chosen to lavish his love and grace and mercy on broken, sinful human beings like you and me, uh, because of all of that, we are then called to make the only reasonable, rational, spiritual response to all that God has done. And that is the invitation, the exhortation, indeed the command that Paul gives that we should offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, a continual thank offering to God that from a heart that has been redeemed and changed and saved by the living God, we are to give out of our gratitude a happy reply of the laying down of our lives in continual worship in the way in which we go about the rest of our lives. So so we've talked about this a bit last time. And indeed, I touched on verses 9 through 13 last week. But if you take verses 9 to the end of the chapter in verse 21, what you have here is this rapid fire series of depending on how you add it up anywhere between 20 and 30 very practical even nitty-gritty commands or exhortations from the apostle paul as uh, he flows out of the truth of the gospel and the mercies of god he appeals to us to live this way and it's just like he's unloading with a semi-automatic semi-automatic um, you know, Bible gun. I, this is dumb. I'm. <laughs> um, he's just unloading on us this rapid fire series of exhortations, and in particular, to what we saw in verses nine to thirteen, was in nine through thirteen. This had a lot to do with the way in which we relate to other believers. But then from verses 14 through 21, these exhortations are broad and they have to do with the way in which we interact with everyone. Uh, and in particular, those that would not be of the family of faith, although it would certainly relate to that. And so there's a theme here. It's very practical about the way in which we relate to one another. And the theme has to do with us being a merciful people. There's a call and a challenge to us here that we are supposed to treat other people better than they actually deserve. And, and this includes everyone. I mean, here's a list of the people Paul uh, draws our attention to. There are persecutors. There are those that are happy, those that are sad. There's everyone. There are the lowly. There are enemies and indeed even people that are evil that we're supposed to respond to in a particular way. And, uh, and at the end of the day, it's like this. It's like what we talked about last time, because the result of God's grace and mercy in our lives, at the end of the day, it, what it makes our life about is not primarily about us. At the end of the day, primarily, fundamentally, everything else is about God and all of His glory. And so ultimately, it's not about us, but it's about God. And one of the reasons that Paul is encouraging and exhorting and challenging us to live in this way is because living this way is partly the way in which we live our lives as a living sacrifice, a continual thank offering to God. Um, but the other side of it is that this is the way 
in which this is one of the ways in which God reveals himself to a watching world. Because these ways of living that Paul calls us to demonstrate for us the nature of Almighty God himself. It, it preaches and proclaims to the people that we interact with that God is like this, that God deals with people like this. And and so anyway, this is, um, this is what Paul is talking about, because God is merciful towards people like you and me, because God treats us in Jesus Christ better than we deserve. You and I are called to be merciful towards other people and to treat them better than we think they deserve. So um, to begin here, let me just begin in verse 14. This is chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verse 14, where Paul says, Bless those who persecute you, bless them, and do not curse them. Okay, so this is true for just about everything that Paul is going to say through the rest of the chapter is the, the, the reason the Bible commands certain things is because they don't come naturally to us. So, so what do we do if someone persecutes us? If you're wronged, what is it that naturally comes out? Well, uh, we, we don't naturally initially just always bless them. Uh, quite often what we do is we literally, quite literally, curse them. Um, you probably don't have to think too long to come up with analogies and examples of people that have wronged you and then the way in which what has come out of your heart, up your throat, and out of your mouth is a literal curse towards that person. I mean, we use words like hell and damn and all sorts of other things, uh, biblical words, right? Theological concepts, and we apply them to other people. Uh, whether we entirely mean it or not, they are curses on people, and we, we express that without even thinking about it. I mean, those things just come out whenever we're wrong. And so, so Paul here says, when you are persecuted, that is when someone intentionally goes out of their way to, in, in particular, uh, to, to afflict and harm you because of what you believe, even in this regard, because of, because of what you believe about what is true, what is right, what is good, because of, you, of what you believe about God himself. And, and they intentionally come to afflict you because of that. Our response is not so much to be to curse them, but indeed it is to bless them. And why would we do that? It's because God himself in Jesus Christ has blessed people like us. And it reminds us and it reminds the world around us that there is grace abounding to people just like us. So, um, so that, that's how Paul gets started. And that shades a bit of everything else we're going to see. But the truth is what Paul is doing here is he is meditating on other parts of the Bible. Indeed, Paul is meditating on the words of Jesus very clearly. I mean, so in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 44 and 45, what does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus says this. He says, love your enemies. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but, but it rains on everybody, right? I mean, it, there's rain, there's snow, there's sunshine, there's seasons and cycles in our world that, that bless and benefit the godly and the godless. The, the natural order of the world that God has established serves in a very kind way even some of the, the worst and most rebellious people on our planet. And, and some of you know from experience what I'm talking about. Uh, in our own sin and rebellion against God, there are times, just like global pandemics, there are times where, where God will pull back his favor and he'll shut up the heavens there'll be famines or plagues or whatever but those are only temporary reminders of of the way in which this world is not the way it should be it's the way in which this world is accountable to god they're temporary reminders just like this 
a coronavirus pandemic that shut down our world right now. This is going to come to an end. I mean, the reality is there will be an end. We'll talk about it in the past tense. And, and, but in the moment, what it reminds us is that we are accustomed to God's blessing, which means we have the, the general assumption of health and prosperity. And when that's temporarily taken away, it reminds us that we're accountable to Almighty God. It reminds us that, that there, we live in a world under judgment. But, but we're also reminded by the fact that we assume that we can cure diseases. We assume that the economy ought to come back, that we live in a world of common grace where God is good to the just and the unjust. God is, he is, um, he is good to the godly and to the ungodly. And that is why Paul says that when we are persecuted, we ought to bless and not curse. So, so that's where Paul gets started. Um, the second thing that we see here is in Psalm 103, verses 8 to 13 or 14. In Psalm 103, I think Paul is meditating on this. This is where... Uh, the psalmist says, this is a psalm of David, is the way it's titled. And it says here, beginning of verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious. He is slow to anger, and He is abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will He keep His anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor does He repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. So this is the psalmist in Psalm 103. It's, it's the psalm of David, which it's reflecting on David's life. Indeed, it's re in David's life, he's surrounded by enemies. He's, he's harried on all sides by problems and challenges and difficulties and, and persecutors. Those that are pursuing David himself, King David himself, literally had men seeking to take his life. And in the midst of that, uh, he calls this to mind. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and, and mercy. And, and we see in David an example of this, actually, when, when David is being pursued in the wilderness by King Saul. And Saul has his entire army. He has leveraged the full force of his government in order to hunt down David and kill and execute and murder him and to take his life and and he's out in the wilderness and he's sleeping in and, and Saul falls asleep in a cave and, and he's given into David's hand because David is hiding in the back of the cave and David's men tell him now's the time God has given him into your hand and so David just says I'm not I am not the one to execute God's judgment on this man and so rather than cursing him he he blesses him he does cut a corner of his robe so that he can show him later show him the mercy he has extended him and um and so anyway we see this just like in jesus words i quoted a moment ago matthew 4 uh, matthew 5 um where jesus says when you act like this you are sons of your father in heaven now just if don't be confused at just this point. I've already talked a lot about this. Our actions follow the mercy of God. So we're responding to what God has already done for us. Our acting this way does not make us children of God. It affirms the fact that we're children of God. Like we're made new by the grace of God. Therefore, we can go act like God in the world. And so, but, but what is it when, when sons act like their father? Well, they reflect him. There's a family resemblance, right? And so when we behave like this to those that persecute us, then what we're doing is we're showing the world what our father is like. There's a family resemblance. Uh, the, the tone and intonation of our voice, it's, it's similar. Uh, the shape and contour of our face, okay? So when we, when we live this way, when we treat people 
This way, it reminds the world around us what God is like. It reminds them of our Father. And so that's the point that Paul is driving here. We saw it in Matthew 5 in Psalm 103. And of course, again, in the book of Ephesians, quickly, uh, Ephesians 4, verse 32, simply says this, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Jesus Christ forgave you. So the fundamental principle here of everything that Paul is saying is that the way in which we are commanded to relate to other people, at the end of the day, it's just not about us, but it is about Almighty God himself. It is uh, a result of what he has done in Jesus Christ for you and me, and it proclaims to the watching world something about the way God is like and some of the way in which God has chosen to relate to us. So um, again, Matthew 5, Psalm 103, Ephesians 4, I would invite you to read and reflect on these things because God is merciful to us and he treats us better than we deserve. So quickly, let me just run through these things. We are in the book of Romans chapter 12 and uh, verse 14. He says, bless and do not curse those that would persecute you. Jesus, of course, is our primary example of this. What did Jesus say when he was being tortured and executed on the cross? What did he say? He said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. He prays for them. I mean, the reality is they knew what they were doing, right? These are uh, hardened soldiers. These are executioners. They know how to kill a man. They know how to torture a man, and they're very good at it. And, and so that's not what he's talking about. They don't understand who it is they're torturing. They don't understand who it is they're executing. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. In the midst of their persecution of him, he is extending to them mercy and forgiveness. Why are we commanded to bless and not curse? It's because by nature, the first thing that comes to us is to curse them. And in reply, God would say, no, 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 no. Be more like me and bless them. So in verse 15, we continue. I just want to walk through these things quickly. Um, in verse 15, Paul says this, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Okay, so there are those that are happy and those that are sad. We're supposed to be glad for those that are happy and, and sad with those who mourn. Why And why is that? Why is this a command in the Bible? You ever wonder that? You've probably heard this verse before. Well, I think because the reality is there are times that we're glad when people are sad and we're happy when they uh, and, and we're, uh, sorry, we're, we're sorry when they're glad and we are glad when they are not. Uh, let me just illustrate this. I mean, the reality is there are people in your life and mine because of our, whether it's pure jealousy on our part, or maybe we don't think they deserve to have what they have, where they can be celebrating and, and whatever it is that has come to their benefit. And it bothers us. Frankly, we don't like it, you know. And so there's something in us that can resist that. When God blesses another person that we don't think deserves it, there's something in us that can rise up and say, yeah, I don't really like that. Um, or, you know, I don't know about you. In fact, actually, I do. The reality is there are times when people suffer that makes us happy. There are people who go through hardships and we think, yeah, they finally got what was coming to them. And I'm glad. OK, I rejoice when they are mourning and I mourn when they are happy. OK, so. That's sort of the natural thing that comes out of us. And so the, the exhortation of this verse is, no, 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 be more like God. Be more like God. We need to rejoice with those who rejoice. We need to mourn with those who mourn, whether we think they deserve it or not, whether they, we think they have earned it or should, should or shouldn't have gotten what they got. And, uh, and the Bible says here, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. It's an invitation for us to be 
like Christ and to reflect the nature of Jesus Christ to the people around us. So um, one of Paul's exhortation. Continuing in verse 16, he says, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Again, Paul is just continuing this rapid fire series of exhortations. And he says, live in harmony with one another. Why would he say that? Well, because just like a piano or a guitar that gets out of tune simply by sitting there, we very often just by nature get out of tune with the people around us. We have to be tuned like a piano or a musical instrument. We have to be tuned by to the standard, like we're tuned to the music of Jesus. And so the way in which we are tuned to him means that we need to seek to be in tune and harmony with one another. And so, um, so Paul says, live in harmony with one another. We're strings out of tune. Never be conceited. Never be conceited. Well, this seems easy, right? Uh, nobody likes someone who is proud or conceited or condescending. Um, and literally, that's the word, the Greek word behind this is never be condescending. Now, now Paul does not mean by that that we should never condescend in, in sort of a gracious manner, like, like be kind or, or gracious to another person. But he means it in the pejorative way, which is condescending is whereas I'm condescending towards you because I think I'm better than you. I'm smarter than you. I'm more, I've got more money than you, more knowledge, more whatever. I'm cooler than you, whatever it is, okay? Whatever it is that, that makes us haughty, the exhortation is for us to be humble because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how gifted you and I are. It doesn't matter how much we've got. Um, the reality is when we think about God, all of us are so far beneath the pale. I mean, it's so far beyond the pale, the difference between us and Almighty God. You think about God who knows everything, God who owns all things. The Bible says he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. It means he owns them all. Um, he is all-knowing, all-powerful. Uh, he is everywhere present. I mean, uh, he, he spans space and time. And so if anyone, had any reason to be haughty, it would be God himself. And yet he chooses to relate to the lowly. Indeed, he is especially pleased to, to draw near to those that are humble and broken in order to, to share his blessedness, his giftedness. He's not holding it over us or other people. He is happy and glad to be able to come into a low situation humbling himself. He's not condescending, but he does condescend to come to you and me. And we reflect that a bit in the ways in which we are humble before others, willing to associate with the lowly. And, um, and so these are some of the ways in which we proclaim to the world around us what God is like. Indeed, sometimes we need to remind ourselves what God himself is like in this regard. So I invite you to reflect on these things. Uh, in particular, verse 17, Paul continues. We're in Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Paul says this, repay no one evil for evil. He sort of picks back the theme from earlier. Um, he says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, rather overcome evil with good. So this is how Paul begins to conclude uh, Romans chapter 12. He says, if possible, I love this statement, as far as it depends on you, okay, it's not always possible. It's not always possible to live at peace with all men, but to the extent that it depends on you, 
live at peace with all men regarding whether it regards strife uh, in a family or perhaps political divisions like in a nation like ours or uh, or whatever all of the discord and things that go on interpersonally with us we are as far as it as far as we are able, we're to live at peace with all men. It's not that we're supposed to give up our convictions. It's not that we're supposed to abandon what we believe. It's not that we're supposed to, um, you know, do any of that. But at the end of the day, what it has to do with is living at peace with others, living peaceably in a way that reflects the benevolence of God to them. So what Paul means is go out of your way to live at peace with others. And perhaps like in our world, in our country right now, you think about the political divisions that we all feel. I mean, every single one of us has a political opinion and, uh, and probably none of them are precisely the same. But of course, running through our country, and it's always, it's very often this case, but right now we're, it's a very heightened sense of this political division. And it's like, you know, you can have political division, uh, disagreements, have them have principled conversations and even arguments. But at the end of the day, uh, Paul would say, the word of God would say that we should love one another. We should live peaceably with each other, even, believe it or not, in the midst of a political conversation, just to use an example. So anyway, uh, Paul continues. He talks about not taking vengeance uh, he says, look, don't be your own private vigilante. We all want to take things into our own, our own hands. Like what happens when you're wronged, you're wronged or I'm wrong, is, is we have this sense rise up in us. We want justice. We want the wrong to be righted. I mean, that's what we want. We want to things to be made right. And, uh, and, and the Lord says here, quoting Deuteronomy 32, he says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And uh, he says, I will repay. I mean, so if you have a sense of wrath about you, which we all do, there's all in all of us, there's all a sense of justice. You see something in the world that's wrong. You experience something in your own life that's wrong. What, what, it, what happens is you want to right that wrong. Well, if you feel that way, how much more does Almighty God feel that way. Indeed, one of the reasons we're called to not exact vengeance on others and to not take out our wrath on other people is because we have a very poor measure. You know, very often we, we are not good at how we measure out justice to other people interpersonally. I mean, so what we do very often is we measure out to them what we think we got and then we extend that just so they get the point, right? And so we lay it on in order to pay them back, or perhaps we don't pay it back right at all. But at the end of the day, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who made you and me, he himself is the only being in all the universe who is perfectly just. I mean, God himself is right. He himself is going to make all things right. Look, there's not a sin or a wrong in all of history or the world that will not go unpunished. Sin will be dealt with in the fires of hell or they will be dealt with at the cross of Jesus Christ. And so as we trust and hope in Jesus Christ, the wrath of God for all of our sin and wrong is lifted and alleviated. But make no mistake, all wrong will be answered for. All wrongs against you, all wrongs done by you, they will be answered for, either by you alone or by you through Jesus Christ. And that is the gracious offer of the gospel, is that if, is that if you are to face God alone, then the wrath of God will come to bear upon you for every sin and wrong that you've ever done. But if we're trusting in Jesus Christ, we have the privileged position of God crediting the righteous, kind, good, right life of Jesus to us, and then the way in which Jesus suffered and died to bear the wrath of God for sin, that is taken from you personally. And so 
I would encourage you, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, today is the day. Do not wait. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait another hour, but turn to him in faith and trust and repentance. But nonetheless, Paul says, do not take uh, matters into your own hands because God is the one who's going to deal with that. Now, as we'll see next in the next chapter, in Romans chapter 13, Paul delegates some of that justice in the world to the jurisdiction of the, of the government. Uh, much as we may not like government or may not like what our governments do, it is an institution that God has established to meet out various forms of justice in the world uh, so that the world is not simply in chaos. But nonetheless, final judgment is in the hands of God or through his ordained means of, uh, of, of the government. I mean, there's three jurisdictions that God has established in the world, three governments, if you will, and that is the family, the church, and the, and the government of nations. And um, so anyway, we'll look at that some next week in Romans chapter 13. But, uh, but this, is what, um, this is what Paul is exhorting us to do. Don't exact vengeance or wrath on others. Leave it to the will of God because God himself will exact proper judgment when the time is right. Everything will be answered for. Uh, all wrongs will be righted. And um, so that, that's God's part. And we just have no idea. You think about the wrath of God. You think about the justice of God. God is, I mean, the justice of God is going to be perfect and amazing and staggering and breathtaking to the degree to which it is right and it is complete and it is just. So we can leave it to God. That's God's part. But our part is what Paul says here at the end. Actually, he's quoting from Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. And this is our part. This is what he begins by saying. He said, well, well, in verse 19, he starts here. He says, beloved. What does he mean by that? Um, well, that's just a word we can throw around to call someone, oh, you're my beloved. But, but the reason I think he uses that word here is because it, it means a person who is loved. What he's saying is he's He's telling us this. God is telling us this because he loves us. Because you are loved, you can hear these words. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Okay, that's God's part. To the contrary, meaning hostile to that, opposite to that. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. Rather, overcome evil by good. Our tendency is to be so overcome by the evil of other, other people that we want to mete it out in an evil way. And yet, the Lord would tell us here, it, Paul is quoting from Proverbs, again, from Proverbs 25. And what he says, if your enemy's hungry, feed them. Don't feed them poison. Don't feed them something that's going to be bad for them. Give them something good. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Don't give them salt water, right? Give them fresh water. Bless them. And, he, and what he says, quoting Proverbs 23, is there's a way in which acting this way toward your enemy will pour burning coals on their head. Now, maybe you think, man, that sounds great. That's actually what I want to do is I want to pour a fire on top of them. Well, there's a way in which that is happening in both the way you mean it and in a way that you don't. I think the way I take that phrase, uh, both in Proverbs and here in the book of Romans, is that by blessing our enemies, we keep burning coals on their head. There's two things that are going on here. What is that? Uh, what we're doing on the one hand is we are showing them what God is like. We're by serving them. We're, we're giving them every opportunity to see. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about God. We're giving them every opportunity to see that God himself is a merciful God. That God himself treats us in a way in which we don't deserve. And so we're going to treat them 
in a way that we don't deserve, uh, in a way that they don't deserve, because we have been treated by God in a way that we did not deserve. So there's that. Uh, and, and the burning coals are sort of this, this fire in their hearts and their minds that are going to eat at them until they can to wrestle with, why would this person be kind to me? And perhaps you'd even have the opportunity to explain, God has been kind to me, therefore I'm being kind to you. But there is a side of this where the justice of God comes in to play. And it's this, if they, in light of your kindness towards them, and in light of your blessing them and serving them, this enemy of yours, and if you serve them food when they're hungry, give them water when they're thirsty or whatever it is, uh, all of that, if they do not see God and they do not turn from their sin and they don't repent of that and they don't come to know the gracious nature of God in life through the gospel, what will happen is this incrimination will build in their lives to where when they stand before God, he will have such ample evidence to say, I gave you every opportunity to repent. You even had uh, enemies of yours serve you in my name. And you could not see. You refused to open your eyes. You refused to turn from your own ways. And in that way, justice ultimately will be brought to bear on them as well. So you may have what you want. But at the end of the day, I think um, what this calls us to be is merciful people who treat others better than they deserve because God is a merciful God and he treats us better than we have ever deserved. God is a just and a holy God and he himself is able to carry out justice in a way that is good, right, and true, a way in which you and I cannot do. It's just not within our power to do it the way God will do it. And so this reminds us of the nature of the gospel and it preaches the gospel to the people that are around us. And so for some of us, you know, maybe you're listening and and you're a bit more tender hearted and you think, how can how can a loving God bring wrath on on the world or on creation? And and you need to hear the truth of this. You need to reflect upon the holy nature of God, the way in which God is just and right and, and he is going to right the wrongs of our world you need and, and the individual wrongs you need to meditate on that but for some of us on the other side for some of you you're like man you love the idea of tough love and the fact that God's going to bring justice on the world and and mete out wrath to people that deserve it and what you need to meditate on is you need to think about the mercy of God you need to think that if you feel that way if you think that way it's simply perhaps because God has been gracious to you and you need to meditate long and hard on the mercy of God. Ultimately, Paul says, the wrath of God, the, the wrath for wrong is ultimately in God's hands. But what is in our hands is to reflect the mercy of God. And he invites us to do it. So I want to encourage you to think about this in your head. Think about the nature of God. Think about the holiness of God. Think about the way in which uh, he is a holy and righteous God has made a way for broken, sinful rebels like you and I to find mercy and grace from him and think about that. And then as you think about it, let that seep down into your heart and think and, and not only think about these things, but let them begin to change the way that you feel, the way that you feel towards God, the way that you feel towards other people and let it affect you. We should be affected by these truths and realities. And then ultimately, let it affect what you do, your hands, the way you go out into the world and relate to other people. Meditate on these things in Romans chapter 8. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 12. And I believe God will speak to you. Let me pray for us. We're almost done. Father God, I thank you for the light of your word that challenges us at some very deep and uh, in real levels. And I pray some of these are even hard, challenging words. I know for some of us, there, there's real hurt. We all have uh, enemies. There, there are real situations that are difficult in our lives. And I pray for the grace and the power to live in such a way that, that not only um, reflects you to the world, 
but also understands it more deeply in our own heart, the way in which you've chosen to to treat us better than we deserve through Jesus Christ, that you have had infinite mercy on us. Lord, we love you. I pray for everyone uh, tuning in that you would reveal yourself to them more and more, that you watch over them, keep them safe in this season. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Finally, just a couple of announcements before we're done. Um, first off, as, as we begin to consider what it might look like to reopen at some point, uh, it, I'm sure gradually at first and then um, later on at some point totally back to normal. But we're, we're weighing those possibilities and trying to figure out what that can look like in the near, in the near future. And so I would appreciate your prayers about that. Indeed, I'd love to hear from you. I sent out a survey by email, at least if you're sort of a local part of our church, uh, and you want to fill that out. It's, it's an email I sent to most of you. I'm sure I tried to. Uh, and then it's also on our Facebook page. We would love to hear from you feedback as we try to figure out the way forward immediately. Um, and so, so keep that in mind. If you are want to talk about that, please let me know. Uh, secondly, uh, a lot of you have asked about giving, how you can contribute financially and your tithes and offerings. And since we're not here gathering together. And so there's two main ways to do that. Uh, there's good old fashioned snail mail where you can uh, just send a check or cash or whatever to uh, you send it to Calvary Church at P.O. Box 117, Hot Sulphur Springs, Colorado, 80451. And uh, the second way that a lot of people are using is online bill pay where you just go in through your bank and do like an e-check where you tell them who, what, when, and where, and they send it for you. So there's that. If you have any questions about that, please let me know. Finally, um, again, I just want to ask, do you, to the extent that you're in need, what is there anything that you need, anything we can be praying for you about? And I would invite you to please reach out to me and let us know. Um, you can call or email. Uh, our information is on Facebook and on our website. So with that being said, let me conclude with this benediction uh, to you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Until next time, until next time thank you for coming. Good to see you. God bless you. And we'll see you soon.